let me welcome you. I mean, not that you need welcoming. The city hails you as a, as a friend and a brother. Great to see you in Thiruvannathapuram. Thank, thank, thank you. You're very kind. So we are here to talk about federalism. And I think I heard you once say that you are not totally convinced that the constitution itself is a terribly federal constitution. Why do you say that? I mean, even though somewhere in the preamble it says that India is a union of states. If you actually look at the structure of um, how powers are allocated, how subjects are allocated, and how that compares, you know, we don't live in a vacuum. You compare that to other large countries' constitutions. It's very clear that much of the power was allocated to the union. And probably because they were trying to carve out a country out of a land where there had been tens of cultures for thousands of years. And so this construct of a country itself needed to be strengthened. And so they put a you know, the majority of the powers, all of direct taxation, you know, which is very rare in, in any other large country, for example, into the union, and they left very little with the states. So in some sense, though we call ourselves federal, and as you say, some people call us quasi-federal, uh, in, in, you know, in nuts and bolts, in execution, we are not federal at all. Well, taxation is obviously one key part of it. And uh, you've uh, obviously been dealing with this literally in the thickets of it as finance minister. Uh, I'm certainly a few more steps removed from the larger issue. But one thing that's become clearly apparent uh, that struck home to me was when you had the finance commission and its terms of reference that were being changed. For the first time, this last recent finance commission was asked to take into account the census of 2011 rather than the census of 1971 in determining allocations. How did that affect your state and my state and other states? Um, I'll answer the short question first and with your indulgence I'll just go back a little bit. The short question is that just as uh, redistricting of MP seats has been frozen since 1976, precisely because you didn't want to penalize those states that achieved the population control targets set by the union government, by the leadership of the union government. Similarly, the notion that you should allocate funds based on the population of today or more closer to today, then rewards those who have not been able to achieve population control and penalizes those like Kerala and Tamil Nadu who have tremendously succeeded where our total fertility rates are below replacement. That's right. Below two. But I think that's actually indicative of a much broader problem. The much broader problem is what should be the basis of allocation of funds between states through the mechanism of something like the uh, Finance Commission. Mm -hmm. And I had the opportunity to appear before the Finance Commission on behalf of the DMK as an opposition MLA. Mm -hmm. And I asked some basic questions. I said, if the goal of transfers in a federal system is to improve equality, that's, that's why the commission exists. It wants to make sure that growth is across all of the country and not only in some pockets. Mm -hmm. It wants to make sure that those better off pay in a greater share of the taxes mm -hmm. and those less well off get, which is, it happens all over the world in every federal society, though maybe not through a finance commission. In some way, it happens that there's net transfers. But if the goal of net transfers is eventual equality or leveling of outcomes, then our finance commissions have been spectacularly failing at their job. Because over 25 years, hmm. over five finance commissions, the proportion of funds coming back to states like Kerala or Tamil Nadu keeps going down. Our population as a percentage of India's total keeps going down. But our economy as a percentage of India's total keeps going up. That means that the transfers are not leveling the playing field. They are actually accelerating the divergence. Mm. Then you ask the question, how can that be? And the core of it is that you are rewarding or incentivizing or using the wrong variables when you allocate money. What's In the effect, the Finance Commission is uh, paying people based on how poor they stay paying people based on how much their population increases. 
as opposed to incentivizing the right kinds of behavior. So at the time, for example, I had said, what you should do is not have a fixed formula projecting forward for six, seven years between the date you start and the end of your period and all that. Nobody can predict the future that well, granularly, how much will Kerala grow relative to Tamil Nadu, for example. What you should do is have a variable formula and incentivize every year or two years hitting certain targets. And the primary targets I suggested was what percentage of girls under 15 stay in school? Mm. What percentage of women are able to access property rights? These kinds of things which we know, particularly based on Kerala and Tamil Nadu, we know that these are clear leading indicators. If you do this right, you will get good outcomes later. So, you should incentivize those leading indicators that will lead to greater equality as opposed to, you know, incentivizing gap to uh, potential or population, which so is like negative, right? That's right. Right now, it's brute demography that's yeah. prevailing. I was looking at some of the numbers and it's actually quite revealing because um, if you look at, because as you know, there was no census in 2021 because of COVID. We still don't know when it's going to come. When it comes, I understand from reliable demographer friends that Kerala will be the first state in India to show a negative population growth since 2011. Uh, I'm told that by uh, the, the next census in 31, Andhra may follow suit. So we're looking at southern states really reaching that level. But if I were to look back at the last available figures, which is between 2001 and 2011, um, all our southern states grew at less than 16% in that decade. Kerala had the country's lowest growth rate, that is 0.49% a year, 4.9% in the 10 years from 2001 to 11. Um, Bihar grew five times as fast. Tamil Nadu grew 75%, that is 0.75% per year. But Rajasthan grew 166%, Bihar 146%, UP 132%. So this means that we are facing a situation where as the fertility rate of the southern states steadily goes down, the fertility rate of northern states stays up. And then you face the simple democratic principle. Isn't our system supposed to be one person, one vote? And if it's one person, one vote, and one person deserves the same amount of development opportunity as someone else, the northern states could turn around and say, well, how can you punish us for having too many people? We're poor because we have so many people, so give us money to make ourselves less poor. Tamil Nadu's fertility rate is 1.6. Bihar's fertility rate is 3.2. Double. So that's the kind of situation we're facing, and this is 2011 figures. Almost certainly the gap has widened since then. And I uh, well, want to balance this with one more set of data. Uh, which, which is quite striking. And as finance minister, I'm sure PTR will have a reaction on this. For every one rupee of tax contributed by Uttar Pradesh, that state receives one rupee 79 paise back from central taxes. For every one rupee of tax contributed by Karnataka, that state receives 47 paise back. So the question that Mr. Sidharamaya asked when he was chief minister is, what is my reward for development? And obviously there isn't any. And one last bit of data. Kerala meets 72% of its expenses from its own taxes, only 28 from central taxes. Bihar, it's almost exactly reversed. 23% from their own taxes, 77% from central taxes. And so we have a situation where, say, Tamil Nadu has a state budget that reflects, of course, only a small percentage of its tax earnings. UP has a larger state budget, even though its economy is actually smaller than Tamil Nadu's, because it's getting more money from elsewhere. Now, these are the clear data points that are available. Obviously, doesn't that put a strain on the federal idea? Because the increasing perception in the South would clearly seem to be that we're getting the raw end of the financial deal. Yeah, I mean, I want to be a bit nuanced here. Of course, that's problematic in the short term. It's even more problematic in the long term. If you take Tamil Nadu, for example, at one point, we were seven, seven and a half percent of the country's economy. We were seven, seven and a half percent of the population. 
and our share of the devolution of the horizontal between the states was seven, seven and a half percent. In 20, 25 years, we've gone down to under six percent of the population, ten and a half to eleven percent of the economy, and our devolution is down to four percent. So in the long term, this trajectory worries me. If we go down this path, in another 15 or 20 years, we'll be 14, 15 percent of the GSDP or GDP, and we'll get back like 2 percent. At that point, the debate becomes even more charged, right? But that's, you know, money is money. At some level, I am much more concerned, you know, as a patriot, as a citizen, I'm much more concerned about what happens to all this money when it goes to the poorer states. Why is it not leading to development? Why, I mean, how is it that with less and less money back, we are still able to achieve, I'm not saying we're fantastic, but we're in the right direction and our people's lives get better, there are more roads, there are better hospitals, uh, there are, you know, better job creation platforms where global industry comes. Why is it that that's not happening in places like Bihar and UP? It's very stark, right? The data is a bit um, dated about two years or three years. But in Bihar, the average age is 19. In Tamil Nadu, it's 34. In Bihar, the average education is elementary school dropout. In Tamil Nadu, it's high school graduate. In Bihar, the per capita income is about half the union average. In Tamil Nadu, it's double. So we have already diverged to a point where all of this money transfer, because if you say UP gets back 170, Bihar gets back about 345. For one rupee in, three rupees 45 back. Tamil Nadu puts one rupee in, we get 30 to 35 paise back. So it's not the money that we begrudge. You know, we, we live in one country, we want everybody to grow. It's the lack of progress. It's like throwing money down a well. What is happening that this money is not able to achieve outcomes? And how long will that sustain? Because as you rightly say, why should the average MP in UP represent 2 million people? In Tamil Nadu, 1.5. And I suspect in Kerala, 1.3 or something like that, right? Not really. Uh, yeah. it's, it's the slightly different numbers. It's yeah. 2 million in Kerala and about 2.7 in UP. That high? Right. No, but I'm saying the voters, not the, not the youth. I know. Oh, voters yeah, are yeah, corresponding yeah, yeah. to this. Yeah. This is the total population. So that, that brings me to the political angle, which, of course, the non-economists here will more easily grasp. In 1976, when Mrs. Gandhi, Indira Gandhi, passed that famous 42nd Constitutional Amendment, the Omnibus Amendment, she wrote in a provision to freeze political representation in the Lok Sabha at the level of the 1971 census. And her argument was precisely what PTR is saying here, which is that we cannot afford to reward underperformance in population control, female literacy, female empowerment, and so on. And therefore, the states that are doing well in human development should not be penalized politically by their losing political clout in the center. And so she froze the allocation of states, which means even to this day, you cannot pass a constitutional amendment, for example, without at least some of the southern MPs having to go along with it, or some of the northeastern Bengal others, which are not part of the Hindi heartland. But meantime, the, what the population divergences that, that the Agaraj and I have been talking about, those divergences have increased. In 2001, the constitutional amendment, the 42nd amendment, lapsed. But Atul Bihari Vajpayee's government had the foresight that without much of a debate, they essentially renewed the same arrangement for another 25 years. Now that second 25 years lapses in 2026. And it is 100% certain it will not be renewed by the Modi government if they are still in power. They've already been talking about it within the BJP. We're hearing about this, that they are very determined to either dramatically expand the size of the Lok Sabha in order to give more seats to the people in the Hindi heartland whose population has grown much more dramatically. And that would be on the fair democratic principle that it's one person, one vote. So if he and I can represent two million people in the Lok Sabha, then so will each UP MP, which means UP will get exponentially that many more seats. The alternative would be to reduce the number of seats in our states and give more seats, uh, states, uh, seats to the north within the same overall total of 543. 
Now, as an MP myself in the Lok Sabha, I see two major problems. The first is the obvious one, that obviously the Hindi heartland will now suddenly become a, a dominant force in the country and will probably have the ability to amend the constitution as, at will, which means, for example, if they want to pass a resolution or a law saying that Hindi will be the national language, there will no longer be any non-Hindi st uh, speaking state able to stop them because they'll have the majority, the two-thirds majority by themselves. But the second thing that's worrying as an MP is, already with 543 MPs, we don't have much of a time to have meaningful debate. We don't have serious deliberation on many of the bills and issues and laws that come before us. Imagine a house of 800 MPs, which is the thing that's being talked about increasingly. It will become the Indian equivalent of the Chinese People's Consultative Chamber, where they all sit down and thump their desks whenever Xi Jinping makes a speech. And I don't want to see my democracy being reduced to that. So clearly there is an urgent problem here. And I, I just wonder what we are all going to do when 2026 rolls along and this issue comes up. You must have given this some thought already. Tell us. Yeah, it worries me as much or more as it does you. I think there's only really one long-term equitable solution to this. Because sooner or later you have to give equal representation. That, that's not in the question. And I agree with you, as it is at 540-something, you can't get any real discussion at 800 is going to be. But the long-term equitable solution is to divest significantly powers that were written into the constitution in 1950 before they were adopted to the states and the local bodies. So you make the union government essentially interstate commerce, foreign affairs, defense, you know, stabilizing the currency, the kinds of things that most federal governments do. And you devolve the powers down to the states. Then it doesn't worry me so much that I don't have that much representation or the ability to, you know, again. So if you have a way of truly <coughs> only national interest issues being <coughs> left with the union government, and most of the day-to-day uh, -day lives of people being determined as close to them as possible, local bodies or state governments, then I think it's sustainable in the long term because the reverse is really dangerous, right? If you see uh, places where people get disenfranchised through the na nature of transition of democracy, then you will start seeing a lot of kind of you know, tearing of the fabric of the country. And it's one thing if, you know, and then you're looking at places like Spain or the United Kingdom, where already, you know, people in developed countries with good standards of living still are demanding the right to self-determination. Now you take places like India, you'll have two added problems because already the quality of life varies greatly. And the second is the scale, right? It's one thing if you have two million or five million disaffected or uh, disenfranchised, or at least with the feeling of disenfranchisement. It's another thing if you have 200 or 300 million people in South India, they start to feel like they're disenfranchised. So that worries me greatly, though I'm only a state politician and, and I intend to remain a state politician till I retire. You know, these are bigger issues that people like you should consider. But as a citizen, it worries me about the nature of our of our country and about its stability. Well, there are two other possible solutions that could address this problem. One would be uh, to convert the Rajya Sabha into a much more equal chamber of the states, the way in which the American Senate works, where every state gets the same number of representatives and therefore they have the ability, for example, to block a constitutional amendment. Right now, the Rajya Sabha actually reflects the same imbalance as the Lok Sabha. So if UP has the largest number of seats in the Lok Sabha, which it does, it also has the largest number of seats in the Rajya Sabha. Maybe one possibility would be to change that to ensure that number one, all states have an equal representation in the Rajya Sabha, and number two, the Rajya Sabha's concurrence is required for any far-reaching decision, including any constitutional amendment, and that could be a way of preventing the worst happening. The second uh, possibility, of course, it may be seen by some as more extreme, but since we're discussing federalism, we can talk about it. 
would be to move India more in the direction of a confederation rather than a federation. What do you think of that? Yeah, I mean, the second is not that far apart from what I… what I proposed, right? But the first also worries me because I'm a member of the GST council for the last two years. And every state has equal voting rights. And that is greatly destructive to the quality of debate or quality of decision making in the council. And I'll tell you why. There are states, for example, Bihar, but you go all the way to the northeast, where from two-thirds to ninety to ninety-nine percent of their budget comes from the devolution from the center. There are states like us that get a quarter or a third of our budget from the center. If we all have equally one vote and the council gets to determine whether taxes should be raised and particularly indirect taxes, which we know are regressive, which the Oxfam report recently said, you know, 50 percent boredom pays 64 percent of the taxes. That's as regressive as you can see anywhere in the world. Then our incentive as people, and I'm saying there's conflict of interest both ways, our incentive as people who get back only 30 or 25 or 40 or 35 of every rupee is to not raise the tax. We don't want our citizens being taxed additionally, regressively, for the sake of fostering some other person's wallet. But every net recipient and a huge net recipient, the, no, no, the northeast states, the smaller states, the poorer states, all of them are for increasing taxation. Because whatever their citizens get taxed in regressive taxation, they'll get back five or eight or ten times that in the devolution. So in the GST Council we struggle a lot where only the large states, the large rich states try to keep these indirect regressive taxes under control and most of these small states, and I'm, and I'm saying this apart from politics, the fact that they all happen to be BJP or BJP coalition governments is a secondary effect. But there's a conflict of interest just based on size. If 95 paise of my budget rupee comes from Delhi, then I'm all for increasing Delhi's revenues, right? And so this one state, one vote model worries me, particularly because of the extremes, right? You have some states that are 220 million people, you have some states like Tamil Nadu, 80 million people or 75 million people. We don't know because census has not been taken. And then you have some states that are half a million people or one million people. Should they really get to have equal votes, especially if there's a conflict of interest inherent in their economic model? That, that worries me a bit. Fair point. Now, the confederation idea was actually a little beyond what you were saying. I was thinking more in terms of the, the notion that had been floated in the past by some, that India would be better off as a confederation of one group of, say, the, 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 the sort of states of southern India as one unit and perhaps one or two different units in the north and the fourth unit in the northeast, and that therefore each unit would have intermediary responsibilities between what the union has and the states currently have? Or is that going to be an unnecessarily top-heavy answer? No, no, no. I mean, that may be a good interim. I mean, you could do confederation multiple ways. I, I took the simplest interpretation, which was more like a European Union or a United States, where by definition it is the United States. So the states come first and the union comes later. But if you say, actually, there's an interim solution that says you have a confederation of the southern states, of the western states, it may be equally or better workable. I haven't applied my mind enough to think about the procedural and technical issues, but, you know, on prima facie, a reasonable approach. But though we say we are a union of states, the power of the center to create the states surely makes it a very uneven thing. I mean, after all, Uttarakhand, Chhattisgarh, Jharkhand, Haryana, Himachal, all these exist because the central government and the parliament in which they had a majority created these states. How can we now treat them as if they are constituent elements, the way in which, say, a Virginia or a, or a New Mexico, for that matter, is part of the U.S.? No, I agree. I think, well, that's why I said, though we claim we are either federalist or quasi-federalist in design, we are actually extremely centralized. And it goes, I mean, that is existential. Do you exist as a state or not? Or can you continue to exist in your old form? Or does the union get to decide that you're now two or three states? 
that's a very dangerous extreme issue but let's come back a lot earlier than that if you can have legislation on subjects that are clearly in the state list in the constitution even after the 42nd amendment in the state list like agriculture uh, like school education then you start wondering uh, how is it and 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 leave the philosophy aside for a second let's just talk about the practicality i've just given you the stark contrast between let's say bihar and tamil nadu how is it possible that a one size fits all program or legislation applies equally to a country that is roughly or a state that is roughly the economic development of a middle income country and another state that is roughly the economic development of a you know saharan country so this this notion that you can design legislate uh, frame schemes or programs from delhi is already broken in practice what surprising to me is you know it's like the laws of physics right they don't change just because you get to have a lot of mps so the reality is that if you try and do these things you will fail there's no question your your results will be very very much worse than had you devolved or customized or state wise and we're seeing that every day we're seeing that the progress of the country is getting retarded by these attempts at homogenization so then that leads to the question how long will it be before people start kind of pushing back against failing systems that produce bad results right. and then that's a much more mundane day to day question than existential can i remain one state or not i know it's a fairly worrying thing too but i'm wondering i think it's only fair to play devil's advocate and ask to what degree is our anxiety fueled by the fact that we happen to have a party that believes in a philosophy of hindi hindu hindustan that keeps talking about one nation one language one leader all of this kind of talk and that if tomorrow that party were no longer in charge would we be much less anxious about the future of federalism or do you really think as you seem to imply that the the fundamental structural issues are the problem and not so much the temporary accident of a homogenizing party that's sitting on top of our country the structural issues have existed for 75 years or or bulk of them why have they not caused us this kind of concern till now because we have never had a government that uh, tried to do this kind of authoritarian dictat driven administration before and there have been bjp governments before right this is not the first bjp so i'm not even talking about the party i'm talking about the construct of that party's administration as it exists today obviously things that are theoretical kind of float around in the back of your head when they become in your face is when the individuals or the particular administration uh, kind of doses them up with steroids and you know thrusts them down kind of uh, in a very aggressive way so of course uh, these issues have always existed they would have probably continued to become more uh, current in one's thinking or come to the foreground no matter what because of the scale of the country expanding because of the disparity expanding that the increasing that was going to happen probably anyway but nothing focuses the mind like imminent threat so i think certainly this administration has uh, kind of exacerbated almost accelerated that to a real uh, imminent fear or immediate fear of are we losing our right to self determination in a substantive way i think we're supposed to be opening this up to the audience in a minute but let me ask one more thing you know there is also the <clears throat> push back from people elsewhere that tamil nadu in particular has been taking an unnecessarily uh, aggressive or regressive whatever word one wants stand on some of the federal issues that other states have not objected to the two examples that come to mind the first is of course the um, the kendriya vidyalayas that even though school education is principally a state subject the center established central schools which were designed principally for central employees 
to park their children when they are in transferable jobs and they needed some common elements. But as I understand it, Tamil Nadu has refused to allow any, um, I'm sorry, not Kendra Vidyalas, beg your pardon, the Jawahar Navodaya Vidyalas, because in the Jawahar Navodaya Vidyalas, Hindi is compulsory and Tamil Nadu has refused to accept that. So Tamil Nadu is the only state where there is no Jawahar Navodaya Vidyalas. That's, that's one kind of question where we ask, is Tamil Nadu being reasonable? How does it matter if there are some Tamil children who are learning Hindi? How does it hurt Tamil Nadu's interests? And the other question also of an example like this is the current controversy over the NEET exams. That if you want children in Tamil Nadu to have the right to take exams in Tamil, that's fine, but surely that should then confine them to medical practice in Tamil Nadu. Whereas a NEET examination would enable them to study, prepare and work anywhere in India. How would you respond to these two criticisms? Well, I think they're both uh, factually wrong first. There are already Navodaya schools in Tamil Nadu. Oh, there are. I have people, uh, I know personally, the commandant, for, former commandant of the DSSE in Wellington is a graduate of a Navodaya school. So. I won't say there are no schools, maybe we don't uh, increase their number as aggressively as other states. But there's a broader issue there about language. And that is that the notion of compulsory Hindi has been uh, kind of the third rail or the, or the lightning rod for politics in Tamil Nadu for over 80, 90 years. We have always felt that if you force some language that we see as non-essential, then it is a slippery slope where pretty soon you'll find either English or Tamil or both being relegated to second class or third class status. So it is at the core of Tamil identity that is our language. I think most cultures language will be at the core of their identity. Certainly our legacy, our, uh, you know, our uh, reverence to our ancestors, all of that is entwined into our support for the language. In that sense, as Perenangi Rana said, if I have a two-language policy, Tamil because everybody wants their mother tongue first and foremost, and after that English as a means of communication across states, across countries, you know, there's one language that everybody can use, and it's actually commercially of value when I go and compete in the world. Why should I need to learn Hindi? And as I pointed out when uh, the parliamentary panel made its recommendation, I said, if you insist on a three-language formula, what you're effectively saying is that those parts of the Hindi heartland cannot be taught English as a second language, even as a second language. And therefore, what you're really saying is that the Hindi heartland gets to have a one language formula, they'll only know Hindi. And Kerala and Tamil Nadu and Andhra and Telangana and Maharashtra and Gujarat should have a three language formula, our mother tongue for ourselves. English to speak to the rest of the world and Hindi to speak to those people who cannot learn English. Right? Why should I need a, you know, a, a three language formula, but it's basically one for them and three for me. Right? So we are completely opposed. I speak reasonable, can save my life Hindi. I studied at a, a central board school. I'm happy for anybody who voluntarily wants to speak Hindi. I'll put the last nail in that coffin. If you remember, the states were divided at independence based on linguistic differences. If that is the case, why do we have a Rajasthan and a Bihar and a Uttar Pradesh and a Madhya Pradesh? If all of them we consider Hindi heartland, what happened to all their original languages? That's what happens when you push Hindi down our throats. So we don't want Hindi. Now, as far as the need is concerned, Tamil Nadu has the highest per capita doctors per thousand people in our country, four doctors for every thousand people, most number of medical colleges, most number of government medical college seats, and we are perfectly far ahead of the national average in medicine in every way. All we said is, if we are funding these medical colleges 100%, and unlike in any other subject, at least to this ex degree, Medical education is inextricably intertwined with public health, right? You cannot run a medical college without a hospital, right? And if the state is a provider of public health, then our medical colleges, our hospitals, we designed in a way that supports our vision of public health. 
primary health centers in every area, including rural areas, and incentives for people to enter postgraduate programs based on how much service they do in rural areas, etc. When it's 100% our money coming out of our budget, not one rupee coming from the union, it's completely linked to public health, which is a state subject. Why do you tell us which exam should be the basis of us sending our children to our colleges? That's the whole point here, right? Now, even if you tell me that the government of India had produced spectacularly better results than Tamil Nadu, or there was some other state that had a brilliant outcome, therefore you say, listen, you can learn from them. We are thoughtful people, we'll try. When I am the leader in the country, why should the fifth ranked student come and tell me how I should do my studies? Makes no sense at all, right? So, that's the reason we oppose needs. Say, who are you to tell us how we should run our money, our health, our children? We know how to do it. We have shown spectacular outcomes. The Indian doctor diaspora around the world is testament to what the Tamil Nadu medical education system has achieved. Why should we listen to you? Fair enough. I think we've covered a lot of ground there. It's some pretty tough, tough issues have come up. <laughs>